Hello and good morning. It's nine o'clock. Yes, really. And time for another big week in British politics. The winner, second time around. Rishi Sunak's a man in a hurry, with a lot to do. A crisis in the economy to fix. A creaking NHS. It's if you don't pay them all. Well, we are trying. We are no, trying. No, you're not trying. You need to try harder. A controversy around his pick for Home Secretary. The Home Secretary made an error of judgment, but she recognised that. He still has time for the snazzy videos. Hello, Joe Biden here. Mr President, it's Rishi. But with his party way behind in the polls, with squabbling in its DNA, he's got to move in and move on. We have one big question this morning. What kind of Prime Minister will Rishi Sunak be? Credited with starting the rebellion against Liz Truss on this programme, no less. Now back in government is levelling up Secretary Michael Gove. And we'll hear from the Shadow Home Secretary, Labour's Yvette Cooper. And sprinkling some stardust, UK and US TV and film superstars, David Harewood and Zachary Quinto are here to talk about one of the biggest and baddest political showdowns in American TV history. And with me at the desk for the whole show, the Green MP, Caroline Lucas, the new chair of Stonewall, the gay rights campaign group, and longtime Tory watcher, Ian Anderson, and the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip, now Lord Hammond, who knows a thing or two about making the sums add up. A warm welcome to the first Sunday of the Sunak era. It is nine o'clock, in case you forgot to put the clocks back, so don't get a fright. And we have a new and Britain's first British Indian Prime Minister. This is what Rishi Sunak said he would do when he was outside number 10 on Tuesday. The mandate my party earned in 2019 is not the sole property of any one individual. It is a mandate that belongs to and unites all of us. And the heart of that mandate is our manifesto. I will deliver on its promise. He says he'll stick to what Boris Johnson promised three years ago. But beyond that, how much do we know? We know he backed Brexit. We know he was fined for breaking COVID rules alongside Boris Johnson. And we know he quit from government helping bring down his old boss. We know over the summer, when he tried and failed to become leader, he predicted some of the economic chaos that shoved Liz Truss out. Oh, and we know he's fond of the odd fancy PR shoot. But this morning, we're trying to get a sense of the kind of prime minister he might be. As you know, you can send us your thoughts on Koonsberg at bbc.co.uk. But let's start with Lord Hammond. Um, you were in the cabinet when Rishi Sunak was a whippersnapper just arriving in parliament as a backbencher. What kind of challenge faces him and what kind of leader do you think he'll be? Well, he's obviously got a huge challenge around uniting the Tory party after what has been a very fractious period. And unless you're united, you can't get anything done. He's got a huge challenge uh, in relation to the economy. He's got to reestablish fiscal stability. And then he's got to articulate a growth plan because that's frankly what we're lacking now. Liz Truss's growth, growth plan is dead in the water. Boris Johnson's, which was based on big trade deals, particularly the US, didn't happen. So um, they're going to have to set out a growth plan because without growth, we're not going to be able to solve the problems that our public services are facing and, and uh, solve this conundrum that people don't want to pay higher taxes, but they do want to have better public services. The only way you can resolve that is higher growth. So that will and must be his relentless and, focus. And that's a real dilemma and a tough entry. And if we yeah. look at the front pages this morning, you can see there the Telegraph with Sunak talking about what he'd like to do about the police. The Mail on Sunday claiming the Kremlin hacked Liz Truss's mobile, a question of security. Some headlines there about COP, the environmental conference, and Rishi Sunak not going to that. And on the BBC News website, that terrible accident that took place last night in Seoul in South Korea. And we'll talk about some of those issues later. But Ian, you've watched the Conservative Party for a long time. How tricky do you think things are going to be for the new leader? Well, they, they shouldn't be tricky. 
Because, look, as Philip's just said, he's made a commitment to implementing his 2019 manifesto. He said that wasn't owned by Boris Johnson, that was owned by the Conservatives. I really want him, Laura, to get on with implementing his manifesto and obviously particularly his commitment around banning conversion therapy, that awful quackery that is imposed on many LGBTQ plus people. So implement your policies. And yes, uh, I've heard a lot from the Prime Minister so far about compassion. I want to see compassionate conservatism, and I see Michael Gove writing about it in the papers this morning too. But it has been an unbelievably torrid time for the Conservative Party, and the country is sort of watched on through this trauma. Now there's a leader who says things are going to be stable, maybe even whisper it a little bit boring. But see, in this morning's papers, you've got minister after minister outlining what they think it should look like. Oliver Dowden saying Rishi Sunak's a safe pair of hands. Michael Gove even apologising to the country for what's happened in the last month or so. Um, Caroline, as an opposition leader, do you think it's going to be any different? Well, let's be clear, he's got a very low bar to, to, to overcome, to be slightly more competent <laughs> than the previous two prime ministers. But I think... Actually, I think it's going to be anything but boring. I'm really worried about the next few months and years. First of all, you've got uh, the, the, the beginnings of what looks like yet more austerity. I'm deeply concerned about that because the country simply can't stand it. We've already got pensioners riding buses to try to keep warm, 2.6 million children who can't get enough to eat. So we already have a real disaster there. On climate, I'm sure we'll come to that, but he's obviously made the call wrongly not to go to the climate cop. On Brexit, let's not forget, he was one of the big cheerleaders of, the, of that, and that has proved to be an economic and cultural disaster. So I think that um, we've got some really worrying months to come. OK, a long list. Listening to all that, you almost wonder why anybody would want the job. But in politics, somebody always does. <laughs> now, at the beginning of this month, you'll remember, we were in Birmingham for Liz Truss's first and last conference as Tory leader and Prime Minister. There were already a lot of nerves around. The mighty financial markets had taken fright at her plans. And the former cabinet minister, Michael Gove, was with us on the programme and lobbed in this little grenade. On the basis of what the Prime Minister said, and she was very clear and authoritative, but it is still the case, I think, that there is uh, an inadequate realisation at the top of government of the scale of change required. So, yes, the energy package was the most important thing in the fiscal event, but broadly 35% of the, uh, the m additional money that we're borrowing is not to cut energy costs. It is for unfunded tax cuts. Now, according to many political watchers, that was one of the first real moments, in public at least, when the beginning of the end of Liz Truss got off to a start. Michael Gove was on the back benches then, and he's back in government now, and I'm pleased to say in the studio with us this morning. You've Thank you, Laura. You've returned you. to government as levelling up secretary. And aged significantly. <laughs> Already, goodness yes. me. Well, let's hope we don't all age too much in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, you got what you wanted. A new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, in the post. He's made a big play this week of saying it's a government of integrity yes. and accountability. Is the Home Secretary a politician of integrity? Absolutely. In terms of the mistakes she made, though, it was serious. It can't be something that can be just brushed aside. And if viewers have missed this, Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, sent a sensitive official document to her own email address and then on to somebody else where it was discovered because she'd done it in error. Now, that might sound just like an admin error, but that is a clear breach of security rules from someone who's meant to be in charge of that as Home Secretary. Well, Suella apologised for the mistake that she made and indeed resigned from government. Uh, but the Prime Minister has made it clear that uh, Suella deserves a second chance and I'm glad that Suella is in Cabinet because she's uh, a first-rate front-rank politician, someone who's absolutely committed to making sure that the two principal responsibilities that any Home Secretary has, safeguarding our borders and improving policing, are discharged with energy and focus. She said, though, as soon as she realised her important mistake... She said she rapidly reported it on official channels. Is that true? That's my understanding, yes. Well, I'd like to show you and our viewers something. We've been shown an email that was sent from her personal email address at two minutes past 10 that day, following the original email she sent at 7.52 containing the sensitive document. Now, in there, she says, please, can you delete the message and ignore? Now, she's obviously realised her mistake, but what does that message mean, do you think? Well, again, I don't know the details of every email that was sent and every message that was sent, but it would seem to me, on the basis of the information that you have there, that it was quite right that uh, if something had been sent in error, 
that the recipient should be invited to delete and to ignore that message. Now, again, I don't know the, the full email uh, chain and history, but that would seem to me to have been an appropriate thing to have done. Except she says as soon as she realised, she admitted she owned up. Now, reading that this morning, please can you delete and ignore, do you think that is somebody who's trying to confess or is it that somebody who may be trying to cover their tracks? Because I think some of our viewers reading that might take the tone from that. It's someone who rather wishes it would go, go away. I'm sure there'll be all sorts of inferences that people can draw, but it would seem to me, on the basis of the facts that I know, that it would have been quite proper for the Home Secretary uh, to have said to the recipient of something that was sent an error, please do delete and ignore it. That is standard practice. Um, and I know that the uh, whenever um, an email is sent an error, um, and it's also the case, I think, that the, the Home Secretary subsequently or that morning had conversations with officials and others, uh, and uh, as a consequence of those conversations, acknowledged um, uh, uh, error and made it clear that she was departing from office. But it wasn't until around noon, actually, that she did then report through officials to Simon Case, the Cabinet Secretary, that this had happened. So what we know now is she sent an email in error at about 10 to 8. About a couple of hours later, she asked someone to delete it. And then a couple of hours later, that is when, through officials, as I understand it, she approached Simon Case and said that she had made this mistake. And Michael Gove, this isn't like sending someone your shopping list by accident. No, you know, I appreciate it. It's not like sending a, having that jaw-dropping moment of sending the wrong text to the wrong friend. This is the Home Secretary committing a clear security breach using her personal email. Yes, and I think that, again, I don't want to get into all of the detail because, uh, as we know, the, the, the message that was sent was intended for another parliamentarian and uh, so it's not as though it was being sent out into the ether to uh, uh, persons unknown. But uh, I don't know uh, all of the conversations that the Home Secretary had with the then Prime Minister and with the Cabinet Secretary. What I do know mm -hmm. is that uh, uh, Suella apologised for the error resigned from office and then when she was reappointed to do a job for which she is very well equipped and which she is completely focused on the but, prime minister but, and the cabinet secretary had complete confidence that suella was the right but, person for that but role. the point is here though michael gove that she said she has said publicly that she owned up to the error as soon as she realized the mistake now some people seeing what we have shown them this morning might think that's not quite the case are you confident that she has given people the full and correct version of events. And you say you're not quite sure. Wouldn't it be better, actually, if the government just did what the Labour Party is demanding and publish all the documents straight away? And then everyone well, can see for themselves. Uh, at the heart of this is a concern, understandably, about security. And one of the things when we're discussing any of these security questions is that it's entirely understandable that um, uh, on behalf of uh, the public, that the media uh, should ask, and on behalf of the opposition, the Shadow Home Secretary, should ask for information to be published. But when we um, publish everything, we also potentially uh, publish information that can compromise the effective operation, not just of government, but of national security itself. Except so that this I, is I, about I want a to be personal Gmail. Oh no, no, quite. It? But I want to be fair mm -hmm. to people who are asking questions, including opposition MPs. They have a legitimate right to do so. But I also critically want to ensure that um, what we don't do is on the basis of the imperfect information that is in the public domain, rush to judgment in a way that would seem to me to be inappropriate. So um, I, I, again, I understand why uh, people are asking these questions. I am satisfied, more than satisfied, that in resigning, accepting responsibility, apologizing, and then in being uh, uh, assured by the uh, Cabinet Secretary and the Prime Minister that Suella coming back into office was the right thing, that Suella is now in a position to do the work that she is dedicated to doing. Except this is doing. a huge distraction, and, and there are other stories well, also in this morning's press about things that have been going wrong in her time at the Home Office, mm. concerns about what her attitude was towards the Migration Centre in yes. Kent, concerns about how she is comporting herself. There are people in your party who believe that Rishi Sunak may have made an error of judgment in bringing her back into government. Well, there are two things there. there, there it, it is always the case that any politician like Suella, who is brave and who's making changes, big changes, and making sure that the police concentrate on crime fighting first and that we protect our borders, any politician like that will inevitably face, um, you know, some uh, uh, opposition. Uh, you're, you're only, you know, there's a phrase that we have in politics, you 
Uh, you only take flak if you're over the target, um, and uh, Suel is on target in order to, but to deal with these things. But just days in her being in and, office, and there are really big questions well, being but, but asked other, about her. But the other thing is that this that isn't just saying, well, if you do tough stuff, you're going to get a tough uh, no, 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 right. Everybody would but, accept that. But that, 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 that's principally what's behind it. But also, you also make the point of, of, about things being a distraction. And again, I, 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 I don't want to criticise the media because I've been a journalist myself in the past. But, but in a way, it becomes a distraction if people are asking these questions. It's but entirely it's a distraction the because the Home Secretary no, no, no. breached security rules no, no. and she's the person in government who's responsible for meant to be keeping us safe. And, and Suella, she broke the rules. Suella apologised. She resigned. Um, uh, I don't want to minimise the importance of security, but I also think it's important to get this particular issue in proportion. And in order to do that, wouldn't it be better then if we had complete clarity as Labour is asking for about the precise chain of events? Well, I think that the Cabinet Secretary has provided that, but more broadly... Oh, where? To, to you? No, I think because he has, because by definition, Suella coming back into office is um, a, a sign of confidence on the part of uh, uh, the government as a whole that uh, she is equipped, ready, and in fact, uh, more than able to deal with the the task in front of but her. Should those assurances be made public then, well, in order to close down? What well, the, the very fact that Suella is in office is that. But because we're just meant to take that for granted. I mean, I don't well, want to seem like I'm labouring this point, but no, this no, no. is one of the most senior people in government who says that she confessed to a security breach as soon as she possibly could have done. Mm. There is doubt about that chain of events. You say there have been assurances inside government that it was all fine, tickety-boo, above order. Yes. Why shouldn't the public see that? Well, I think, they, they, again, I, I made the point earlier, and I think it applies to a number of, of stories that are in the newspapers today, that when you are dealing with national security matters, uh, it is understandable that people will uh, look at the stories and say, hmm, what lies behind that? Mm. But when you are dealing with national security matters, then it, it will often be the case that there is information that you cannot share because that might compromise national security or the effective operation of government. And so, again, uh, uh, having been a minister... That's the point, isn't it, that she was willing to share it? But anyway, we've got big issues to talk about we with do, you, and we want we to do. talk about particularly housing this morning, which is Precisely. part of your job, Michael Go, because it's an issue millions of people in the country are very anxious about their rent, anxious about their mortgage, and it is part of your job in government now and previously to get on with it. Um, just to start off, we've had an email from one of our viewers, Victoria in Gosport. She's a renter. Mm. She said, I and millions of others are at risk of losing our homes because of rising interest rates. I'm going to be priced out of the town I've lived in my entire life, which has seen the rent increase by hundreds of pounds in just the last 12 months. Is it the government's job to protect people who rent from a private landlord or are they just at the mercy of the market? No, it is the government's job to do everything that we can uh, to support people through difficult times. And the Prime Minister in his article in the Mail on Sunday today mm -hmm. has made the point that while we do need to take some, some pretty tough measures in order to deal with inflation, that fairness is his lodestar. And that means that we will, uh, as Ian Anderson pointed out, uh, act in a compassionate way to try to ensure that those who are vulnerable are supported through this so difficult time. So what will you do about it then? Because the property website Rightmove tracks prices and it says the average rise outside of London is 11%. In London, it's 16%. Yes. So that's an extra £100 a month on average, £300 a month on average if you're in London. What are you going to do about that? Well, we're working with the Chancellor, with Jeremy Hunt and with the Prime Minister to look in the package at the time of the autumn statement uh, to see exactly how we can ensure that we, we help people um, uh, at this extraordinarily difficult time. And I can't preempt what's going to be announced then, mm -hmm. but what I can do is to point to what Rishi did when he was Chancellor. So at critical moments uh, during uh, uh, COVID, Rishi made it clear that while there were some very tough decisions that we had to take in order to combat the virus and to keep the economy mm -hmm. going, that um, economic support would be targeted on the very poorest. Well, so so you, you can see what economists call his revealed preferences, mm -hmm. and they are to do what is in the national interest and at the same time to support those people who are, who are facing the but toughest times. Might that mean financial help for renters, for people who are renting their homes, who've seen increases, might that mean cash for them? Well, we know that people both in the private rented sector and also mm -hmm. people in the social rented sector, people uh, who are living in council houses or people who are living in housing association homes are facing tough times. We're looking at a range of options so to that, help them. So could that mean extra cash for people who are struggling to pay their rent? Well, it, it, it will mean or could mean targeted support for 
all sorts of people who are in difficulty. But again, what I can't do at this stage is anticipate. But that's very interesting. So the principle is the there, there, support. there could be direct support for people who are struggling to pay their rent. Well, there, there, are, there are people who are going to be in all sorts of difficult economic mm -hmm. circumstances in the next six months. Rent is simply going to be one of the challenges that people face. We know, and, I, and it, it's, it's I take obviously no pleasure in saying this, that we've also got food price inflation. Mm -hmm. We've already had support for people mm -hmm. who are facing rising energy prices. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the combination of inflation and higher interest rates in order to it's deal with that inflation tough. create difficulties. And there are different ways of supporting people, whether that's through universal credit, whether that's through the tax system, or whether it's through and, a and direct support. And we'll hear support. more on that then in the, in the next few weeks, no doubt. Part of the problem is this is all been made tougher by the shortage of houses being built. Yes. Now, the Conservative first promised in 2017 that you would build 300,000 houses a year by the mid-2020s. Is that still the target? Yes. And that remains in place because the under Liz Trust people seem to back away from that. And Robert Jenrick, who was the Housing Secretary, previously said you were going to miss the target by a country mile. Well, uh, no one um, uh, can deny that it's going to be made more difficult because of the economic circumstances that we face. You're absolutely right, we need to build more homes. We need to build um, more homes for people to own. We also need to build more homes for social rent. We need mm -hmm. to build more council houses, more housing association homes. We need to build the right homes in the right places. But, um, you know, as Rishi said, we need to be straight with people. The cost of materials mm -hmm. has increased because of the problems with global supply chains. And also, a very tight labour market means that the, uh, uh, the capacity to so, build so those homes at do, the rate we want is constrained. Wanted, but I, Sorry. It, it is tough to do, but Lee Rowley, who was a, a yeah. housing minister in the summer, said that Liz Truss would abolish top-down housing targets. I just want to be crystal clear. You're saying no, that target is 300,000 a year. That is absolutely part of your programme. The, uh, there are two things there. Um, uh, the first thing is that the top-down housing targets that Lee was referring to, and indeed Liz was referring mm. to, are part of a broader and different calculation from the 300,000 in the manifesto. We're talking two different things here. But my view is uh, that what we do need is a fair way of allocating housing need uh, that takes account of changes in population. Mm -hmm. Some of the calculations that have been made in the past mm -hmm. have been wrong. Mm -hmm. We need to rebase that. But what we critically need to do is to make sure that we have local communities consenting to development. And that means that homes need to be more beautiful. Mm -hmm. It means that we need the infrastructure alongside them. But it critically also means that we need to make sure that the environment is protected as well. But we're still talking about this, you know, 12 years into Tory governments. And we're in a situation where rent is spiralling out of control. The number of affordable homes is nowhere near the target yeah. of what people would want. The amount of social housing being built is barely touching the size. I think it was only 6,000 last year. Having a secure home and getting on the property ladder, both of those things feel so far out of reach for many people. And I'd like to play you a question from a young housing campaigner called Kwejo Tenaboa, who I believe you've come Great across. Guy. Brilliant campaigner. Let's listen to what he wants to put to you. More and more social and private housing tenants are reaching out to me complaining about their poor living conditions. After a year and a half of campaigning, I've seen the same landlords get away with it with no real consequences. No heavy penalties, no landlords being fired. Now after Grenfell, we were promised that things would get better for tenants. So why is it that bad landlords are still getting away scot-free whilst tenants are forced to live in squalor? Why is it, Michael Gove, that that's happening? Well, we've got legislation coming now, partly thanks to Quadra's campaigning um, and partly also thanks to the campaigning of uh, the Grenfell mm -hmm. uh, families. We have new legislation uh, to make sure that uh, social landlords uh, live up to their responsibilities, tougher regulation, a stronger voice for tenants, bigger penalties for social landlords who are keeping people in uh, homes for social rent which are not fit for habitation, and we're also bringing in legislation to deal with the private rented sector as well. And can you guarantee that the impact of that legislation for Quejo and other people watching this morning who are getting a rough ride yeah. and many of them living in terrible conditions, can you guarantee that la rogue landlords will be prosecuted, they will be named and shamed as is part of yes. your plan as I understand it in Parliament, can you guarantee that will actually happen? Because I think for a lot of people mm. watching this morning will feel, I've heard politicians talk about this for years and actually the situation is getting worse, not better. No. Um, uh, before I uh, left government in, in the summer, um, we had put in place plans both to deal 
with social landlords that are not doing their job effectively, and also to deal with the very small but noxious minority of private landlords who are not treating uh, their tenants properly. Um, and we will bring forward that legislation to deal effectively with them. But a recent BBC investigation showed in the last five years in private rented accommodation mm. where terrible things, hazards as they're known in the in industry, yeah. were identified, less than 1% of those things resulted in a prosecution? Well, we, we are going to take steps uh, in legislation to deal with that. There are a number of... 12 years, Michael Gove. Oh, you had 12 years and 1% of terrible things that went wrong led to prosecutions. Well, uh, I am, um, you know, Laura, that I'm someone who, um, uh, if I'm fortunate enough to be in office, I don't want, want to hang around. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I had 10 months beforehand in this job and we brought forward legislation. However long I still have in this job, um, then I'm determined to make sure that we, we deal with that. There are, there are all sorts of abuses in the, in the uh, housing market. There's another problem, uh, which many of your viewers will be familiar with, with supported housing. Mm -hmm. You've got rogue elements who take money from the state, saying that they're going to provide vulnerable people, not just with a roof over their head, but additional support. And some of these, you know, uh, 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 chances are leaving people in dire circumstances. Bob Blackman, uh, a backbench Conservative MP, mm -hmm. is working with the, the charity crisis in order to deal with that. We want to work with and them we'll watch very in order to deal with that problem. And we will watch very carefully on this programme what happens in housing. We know it's an issue that millions yeah. of people care about and we will return to it. So it's great to talk to you about that this Thank morning. You. I just want to touch on a couple of other things. Um, when we last met, you made it very clear that your belief was that benefits should rise in line with inflation, as Boris Johnson promised. Should they? Well, we're going to have some very, very tough decisions to make in the autumn statement. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Rishi's whole instinct, mm -hmm. everything he's done in politics, is to seek to protect the vulnerable. Sounds like you're walking away from that, though. I can't anticipate what the chance is going to announce. Do you still want it to happen, though, if the money could be found? I want to make sure that we protect the vulnerable, mm -hmm. and I know that Rishi is absolutely locked onto that goal. OK, well, that maybe sounds like it's not going to happen, but let's see what happens. Um, lastly, one thing that has been a big topic of conversation in the last few days. The Prime Minister has not going to yep. COP, the environmental summit. The government has also signalled to the King they don't want him to go. And Alok Sharma, your colleague and the climate envoy for this country, who now is demoted from sitting in the Cabinet, he's clearly not very happy with what's going on. Would you blame our viewers for thinking that this new leadership of the Tory party doesn't take the environment and climate change as seriously as the last? No, we take it incredibly seriously. Um, uh, several things that I'd say. We want to feel the strongest possible team um, at COP26. But Not even, the Prime Minister. Even, no, we want to feel the strongest possible team. Uh, but even more important than who goes is what we do. We're the country in the G7 which is decarbonising fastest. Um, we have a 25-year environment plan that ensures that we enhance protection for nature and indeed make sure that whether it's on land or on sea, that we do more for biodiversity. We're also making sure that with the move towards electric vehicles, with the phasing out of internal combustion engines, um, with moves towards renewables, that we fulfil our climate, nature and environmental obligations. And we're also reviewing plans that uh, under Liz Truss were being brought forward, uh, these investment zones, mm. um, which understandably... So they might go? Well, they caused some concern. Mm -hmm. One thing is we'll look at them, we will review them, but there is no way we're undermining our environmental protections. Okay. Um, Rishi supported me to the hilt when I was Environment Secretary in making sure that we could show environmental leadership. Judge us by our actions. Well, I think our viewers certainly will. Michael Gove, thank you very much indeed for coming in this morning. Michael Gove, never gone for long, despite all the machinations of the Tory party. Thank you to him for coming in. Lots of interesting fodder in there. Let's see what our panel had to make of it. Firstly to you, Ian Anderson, Tory watcher for a long time. What did you make of what he had to say about Suella Braverman as Home Secretary? So, look, this is not the ideal start, uh, is it? Um, uh, it wasn't the ideal end of the previous ad administration. For me, and I think for a lot of viewers, the key thing will be this. Um, our national security is absolutely paramount and perhaps, you know, even more paramount if that's possible in the current environment that we're in. Um, it's the prime minister to make a judgment as to whether or not national security has been compromised. I'm not going to call on this programme for anybody to come or go. That's not my role. But the Prime Minister needs to be absolutely satisfied. Home Office officials, the security services need to be completely confident 
when they send information to a Home Secretary, it's not going to go anywhere else. Well, it's interesting because there is some widespread concern. The Observer talking this morning about secret meetings of the Home Secretary and MPs on the back benches and a concern that some people have around that. But Philip Hammond, one of the interesting things there was to hear Michael Gove commit very firmly to the target of bringing 300,000 300, new homes every year. Now, I think that target was brought in when you were a Chancellor. Why is housing so difficult as a problem to solve in this country? Well, it's a huge challenge for the Tory party because on the one hand, you've got a, a commitment, as Michael Gove's reiterated this morning, to building more homes in, uh, in, in aggregate. But on, at the same time, you've got the difficulty that many um, of our core supporters and voters in the Tory party do not want those homes um, built near them. And uh, that's the challenge here. Um, everybody, everybody wants to solve this problem. Nobody wants it solved on their doorstep. <clears throat> and resolving that challenge is, is uh, a, a very big uh, issue for government. I think Michael very carefully there distanced himself from the kind of top-down targets that will actually deliver, saying to individual local authorities or regions, you have to build this number of homes. But I'm afraid without those kind of prescriptive targets, the 300,000 it just ambition won't, won't happen. Just won't happen. And what about the wider economic picture? I mean, you heard him there as well, I think, very carefully walk back from his desire to see benefits rise in line for inflation. I mean, to you, how prepared should our viewers be for things to get very, very bumpy? Well, I think it is going to be incredibly difficult. The terms of trade have worsened against the UK. The markets have um, stamped their foot and mm -hmm. said that um, fiscal discipline will happen. I heard Michael Gove talking about targeted support for all sorts of people, mm. but I didn't hear him saying how it will be paid for. The option of borrowing to do it is no longer on the table after the sort of market tantrum uh, <laughs> last month. Uh, we know that. By the way, that applies to a Labour government wanting to borrow more for more public spending, just as it applies to a Tory government wanting to borrow to cut but taxes. But if you were in this position, would you be borrowing at the same kinds of levels if you were still the Chancellor? Uh, no, well, I've always been um, very much a fiscal conservative, um, and I think fiscal conservatism will reassert itself now. But just a word of caution mm. on the uh, benefits uprating. Um, all chancellors, all governments try and roll the pitch ahead of any budget or statement and so maybe perhaps set, they might be exaggerating maybe set quite up a few straw men. Um, I'd be very surprised if they don't end up uprating benefits in line with inflation. That's very interesting. Well, Caroline, you're shaking their head then because, well, of course, in the economics as in politics, there are always choices, aren't there? There are always political choices. And the fact that this government right now can't say that it will uprate those benefits mm. in line with inflation, I think is, is deeply concerning for so many people for whom this is you know, a matter of of almost life and death, quite frankly. Mm. So if, if it's the case that Michael Gove claimed that fairness is Rishi Sunak's lodestar, then he should be able to say this right now. He should be able to say, instead of talking about eye-wateringly difficult choices, that's always code for hitting the poorest. He could be introducing a range of wealth taxes. Why don't we have some taxes on people's assets rather than just on income? Those are political choices. Why don't we start looking at those instead of always going to hit the poorest first and hardest? Philip Hammond, why not? I mean, there well, are other ways of doing this. There is not one economic orthodoxy, even though you say fiscal conservatism is back, to use the technical term of being, you know, counting for every single penny. There are other ways of doing it. That's absolutely right. But the problem with people on the left who always reach for tax the wealthy have to recognise the reality. I think Mervyn King said it on your programme last week. There just aren't enough of them and they just don't have enough That's wealth that this will solve the problem. Caroline. Yes, you can, of course you can tax wealthy people a bit more, but the reality of the fiscal challenge we face means that, and, and the demographic pressure we face, means that if we want public services not just to be maintained but to be improved, everybody including ordinary earners, are going to have to pay more Caroline, tax. Caroline, briefly to you on this, and then I want to talk about COP. But what, do you think, what do you make of that? I, I just fundamentally disagree. There are a whole range of different wealth taxes that you could include, and they could include Even things like numbers. property taxes as well. Well, there's been a report that was just out last mm -hmm. week that talked about £37 billion from a range of five different uh, wealth taxes that you could, in, uh, you could do. That would start filling that black hole that we're supposed to be worrying about right now. I would also challenge you when you say that governments can't borrow anymore. We should be careful not to learn the wrong lessons from the fiasco of Liz Truss's budget, because there's a wealth of difference between borrowing to pay for tax cuts 
um, borrowing to invest in productive capacity in this country. That. And that is exactly what we need to see. OK, let's talk about COP. Um, we know the Prime Minister isn't going. At the former Prime Minister uh, is suggested that he might be going. On the front page of The Observer, Boris Johnson perhaps might be attending COP. And also in the Sunday Times, we have Alok Sharma, the climate envoy for the government, basically a a attacking the fact that Sunak isn't going and clearly unhappy with the approach they're taking. Caroline, you pleased that Boris Johnson might go to COP? Well, I think this is probably about the first decision that Boris Johnson has made that, uh, that I think I might support. Because no, if, it embarrasses, <laughs> if it embarrasses Rishi Sunak to reverse his disgraceful decision and actually get there himself, all and good. I mean, I'm not suggesting necessarily that Boris Johnson is doing it for the good of the planet. I suspect a great deal of self-promotion is going in there as well. But let's take it. Let's have him go there. Because it is absolutely... It, it, it is so wrong that, that Rishi Sunak is not going because the UK is still the holder of the COP presidency. Mm -hmm. Symbols matter. If we're really saying that in the sixth richest country in the world that our prime minister can't be bothered to get there because he's busy, you know, what about all of those prime ministers in countries that are absolutely on the front edge of the climate emergency right now? Except that, is there not an argument that sometimes, and I know having covered a lot of these kinds of summits themselves, sometimes there is a lot of chat, a lot of gathering, quite a lot of hangers on, sometimes big political summits don't actually turn out to be what they promise. And actually all the work sometimes is done on the phone or in quiet corners and the sort of pageantry of these big summits sometimes doesn't really make a difference. I think you need all of that. I've been to these big summits mm. and I agree with you. They, they can be a, a massive jamboree, but at the same time, when the future of, of, of climate talks depends on trust, between the countries in the global south who are desperate for the global north to actually put mm. some money on the table and to demonstrate by their own actions that they're serious, then these meetings do matter. Glasgow agreed to a so-called ratchet mechanism where mm. we're supposed to be increasing our ambition when it comes to climate emission reductions. The UK has not increased its reduction target since last year, since Glasgow. That is bad news, contrary to what Michael Gove was saying. We need to be there to send a symbol that we are serious about these talks and we will put our money where our mouths are. Well, it'll be very interesting to see what actually happens at that summit. And we'll be talking about it in the next couple of weeks. Um, I just want to talk about another issue. So the World Cup is coming football fan or not, it's going to be everywhere. But there's an important element of the fact that the tournament is going to be in Qatar, which has a pretty appalling record when it comes to uh, rights for LGBT people. There's an article this morning by John Fashionu, the former England player whose brother Justin took his own life, um, who was gay. And he tells the Mirror that Qatar needs to learn to accept fans rather than the other way around. Now, Ian, in your role as new chair of Stonewall, the Foreign Secretary told people this week that they should show respect to the host country. Was that the right message? Well, I noticed as well that Number 10 Downing Street very, very quickly, shall we say, corrected the Foreign so the Secretary's position. It, it, it was the wrong thing to say. Um, look, you know, f for me, and we've seen this in countless uh, examples of countries around the world that are looking to liberalise their laws. They're really destructive laws around LGBTQ plus people. Um, earlier this year, um, uh, I uh, resigned from a role that the government had asked mm. me to do mm -hmm. to be the LGBTQ business champion. Why did I resign? I resigned because the government wasn't pushing forward with its manifesto commitments. Alongside that, we collapsed a conference which should have been an opportunity for business, for civil society, for everybody that's interested uh, in, in that policy lot, to be able to push forward reform. But a lot of this debate, Ian Anderson, particularly around the issue of trans rights, has become very heated, very aggressive sometimes. As the new chair of Stonewall, do you think it's gone too far? I mean, there are particularly some women who are gender critical, as it's known, who are asking questions about this whole debate, who feel that they've been shut out and unfairly targeted. What would you say to people? So this is my first public appearance as, as the incoming chair of Stonewall. Um, anybody that knows me knows that I believe in a big tent. I've engaged with the Labour Party so far. I've met actually government ministers in the previous uh, administration um, who've given commitments that they'll push forward uh, on uh, a ban on conversion therapy. What I want to do is talk to women's groups, I want to talk, I want to talk generally, Laura. I want to get this conversation off Twitter. I want to stop debating people's lives and get everybody to come together so again. more shouting and less talking. Less shouting and more, more conversations and more policy action. Okay. 
finally, I can't help but show, my, show us and show you something that's in the papers this morning. The Sunday Times pulls back the curtain on Liz Truss's expectations of what she wanted when she went on foreign trips. And it's quite a long list. A double espresso in a large cup, absolutely no mayonnaise on anything ever, and a cool bottle of Sauvignon Blanc in the fridge overnight. Philip Hammond, when you were Chancellor, Foreign Secretary tra tra travelling the world, did you make these kinds of demands? What was in your rider, as it's known? No, I think when I was in that role, we still had fresh in our minds the Liam Byrne incident, ah. if you remember the memo he issued to his <laughs> civil servants on coming into office. And uh, uh, I, I think that the lesson was clear. Do not make any such demands that will be published and will be used in evidence against you. So no, no requests, no white lilies or a particular colour of M&Ms? No, no requests, no requirements, go with the flow, N never know quite what to expect when you get there, <laughs> but always um, be ready to, um, to smile and smooth it over. Beyonce meets politics. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you all very much for now. We'll be more from you at the end of the programme. Now, we in this studio, we love a bit of argument and debate. But back in the 1960s, the idea of political pundits taking each other on on TV was unheard of. Our ancestors at ABC TV in the States had a brainwave. They decided to invite two big famous political thinkers to spar live on air. The liberal writer Gore Vidal and his nemesis William Buckley, who was a defender of Southern segregation, went head to head but no one was quite prepared for what happened next. With millions watching, their fiery exchanges became part of the troubled landscape in America in the late 60s. And their spats are the basis now for a new play by the political playwright James Graham that is about to open. Its stars are David Harewood and Zachary Quinto, who are here this morning. But first, let's have a clip of them in rehearsal. I don't think it's right to present Mr Gore Vidal as a political commentator of any consequence since he is nothing more than a literary producer of perverted Hollywood-minded prose. Now, now, Bill, careful now. I'm almost through. Ha-ha, <laughs> in every sense. As usual, Mr Buckley, with his enormous and thrilling charm, manages to get away from the issue towards comedy. He is almost always on the right, I think, and always in the wrong. And you certainly must maintain your bloodthirsty reputation, Bill, as the Marie Antoinette of the right wing. Mr. Smith, uh, I was invited here and am prepared to try to talk about the Republican Convention, but I maintain it's very difficult to do so when you have someone like this, who speaks in such burps and who likes to be naughty, which has proved a very highly merchandisable vice. Not unlike your so public vices. No, I don't have any wickedness, public vices. Bill. Funny, but vicious. Well, both of them are here now. Thanks so much for coming in. Um, firstly, I want to ask you both, why is it relevant now for our audiences to rewatch this? I mean, sitting here listening to all of you debate mm. the issues of the day, uh, I feel like these conversations can really be traced back to this moment um, in media history when this decision was made to bring opinions into a format that had never really made space for them before. Uh, and these two characters that we're playing um, represent the origin of that. And then it's so relevant to trace where it led us and where I think we've arrived. Absolutely. I mean, you've, ba you've basically got uh, someone on the right and someone on the left. And you, I mean, we are living in a very, very polarized world right now with very little sort of intellectual or sort of uh, uh, discourse between the two. We are almost further apart now than I think we've probably ever been. And, uh, and, and I think this this documentary or this play really points to that moment and, and brings it to the fore. Who would they be now, though? So there were these huge political thinkers. Do you see people in our modern discourse, either on this side of the pond or the other, who could actually take on these roles? Because there's lots of shouting. As you were just saying, I think there is, uh, being here, coming from the States, I will say it, it feels like there's uh, perceptibly more of an integrity in your conversations mm. about politics and about the landscape. I think where I've just come from and where I live, uh, there's been an incredible denigration of, of, uh, of the discourse. conversation mm. to a dangerous degree, actually. Mm. Dangerous. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, if you just look at what's happening now, I feel like, uh, you know, violence is being Absolutely. incited uh, left and right in, in, in our country in particular. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I think the thing about Gore Vidal and William F. Buckley is no matter where you fall on a political ideological spectrum, they both 
uh, believed passionately and argued substantively about mm. where they were coming from, mm. which I don't think is as true today. Well, let's have a clip of how they actually spoke to each oh, yeah. other. The point of the American yeah. democracy and some is you can express to any point of view you want. Shut up a minute. Uh, stop calling me a crypto Nazi. Let's, let's stop or calling I'll names you in your goddamn get... face. And you'll stay plastered. Gentlemen, oh, let's Bill. let the author of my I'm going to sock you in the face. I, I mean, it's pretty <laughs> brutal, isn't that, that, that it? That moment there was 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 really in the heat of heat of battle, and that's the moment that I think the character I play, William F. Buckley, probably regretted for the rest of, rest of his life, really, right. where he let his his cool he let his cool slip. Uh, but prior to that, the debate was very much a, a battle of ideas and actually quite humorous. And the, mm. the two of them are great wordsmiths. And they and also all look like they were kind of enjoying it a bit. Exactly. But, exactly. I, I want to ask you about playing that character, though, because obviously he was taken to task over some of his racist attitudes, his defense of the South and defense of segregation. How did the conversation go when you were asked to play it? Well, I mean, um, at first I sort of um, turned it down. I did you? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't quite see how I could, could get there. But I think it's important as an actor that you don't necessarily judge your character that you're playing. So I had to sort of find out about him and you know, delve into his, his politics, delve into and really try and understand him and try, and try and find a way into his humanity. And whilst, yes, he did originally vote against some of those uh, 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 early civil rights moves, I think he was more of an elitist than a racist, a racist and didn't feel that blacks were necessarily uh, ready to take positions of power. And once he actually saw how articulate and how, uh, you know, how brave and how forward-thinking and progressive um, many black Republicans were, I think he very much did change his tune. And throughout the 70s, I think he actually predicted that there would be a, 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 um, a, a black president before uh, uh, Kennedy actually so said he went that. on a journey. He, so he did go on a journey and he did moderate his position. And actually, when, once he saw how violent mm. southern segregationists were, um, he, 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 he very much changed his tune. Zachary, just finally to you, a lot of our viewers will know you, of course, from being Spock in Star Trek. Our new Prime Minister, we know, is a Star Wars fan. I'm told he has watched some of Star Trek, but he's really a bigger Star Wars fan. Um, but I just want to ask you about that. We have our first British Indian Prime Minister in this country. Americans, there's been some commentary saying that, well, Britain has, there's been a backlash, that Britain has had some racist feelings towards the new PM that's been really denied by people here. But what, 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 how would you see that? Um, I mean, I think in the context of a Star Trek conversation, you know, uh, <laughs> there's uh, there's so much inclusivity at the heart of that franchise, and uh, and I feel like anything we can do um, to expand and challenge people's expectations or rigidity mm -hmm. um, is what we have responsibility to do, um, and I think part of that is conversation, part of that is discourse, and. Part of the honor of playing a character like Gore Vidal is not only was he an intellectual titan, but he was also a, a, a gay icon in many ways and, and had forward thinking uh, beliefs that were unimpeachable, uncompromised, ahead of his time. Um, and I think that's the kind of conversation that I'm interested in being a part of. So to play a character that so uh, truly represents that with, with real authenticity and integrity is something that uh, I'm really excited to be able to do. Okay, Zachary Quinto and David Herod, thank you so much for thank coming you. and having thank a conversation you. with us here in the studio. It's great to have you. And the play, Best of Enemies by James Graham, opens next month in the West End, where those characters will be brought to life. Now, remember, we always want to know what you think, especially we want to hear what you'd like us to discuss on the show. You can always email us at kunzberg at bbc.co.uk. If you're into social media, you can talk about what's going on using the hashtag BBC Laura K. And for live chat about what's happening right now, you can go to the BBC's live page at bbc.co.uk forward slash news. And after the show, I can join you there Well, I'll be posting some of my thoughts about what we've heard. And on one of those issues, of course, is the pressure on Rishi Sunak over his new Home Secretary, just days into his new job. He reappointed Suella Braverman and she had already stood down the week before after she was discovered to have broken security rules. We've talked about that a bit this morning with Michael Gove, and we can now discuss that and other issues with Labour's Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary. Good morning, Laura. Good morning, great to have you here. Now, we showed our viewers, and I think you might have seen also, that Suella Breverman, having realised the error, having been told of her error, sent an email that morning asking the recipient to delete and ignore the message that she had sent to them in 
error. What do you think the government should do about that? Does that change what's happened here? I think it adds to the serious list of questions that we now have about this reckless reappointment of Suella Braverman to be Home Secretary. There was obviously the initial uh, breach of the ministerial code, the security lapses involved, but now questions about whether she has given an accurate description of what happened. She said that she reported it straight away. There are other reports as well that no, she didn't and was confronted on this. And also the further the reports of her being involved in other security leaks or security leak inquiries around both uh, a case involving the security service mm -hmm. and also a case involving the leak of sensitive legal advice. So we would like that, as much of this information as possible, to be answered to Parliament mm -hmm. and anything that is sensitive mm -hmm. to go to the Intelligence and Security Committee because this is too important. National security is too important and it goes to the heart of Rishi Sunak's error of judgment as well. And of course everybody would accept that national security is paramount. Mm. However, Suella Braverman has accepted she made a mistake, she has apologised, she said sorry. Actually, aren't you at risk of overblowing this? This was an error, she's admitted it, move on. Well, I listened to Michael Gove being interviewed or some of his interview earlier and I thought that he was really badly minimising issues around national security. We've seen from the reports overnight about mm -hmm. allegations of other security breaches and cyber security threats that there are but those serious are unproven questions. unproven allegations, of course, but we've seen, when it comes to the thing that we know about, I mean, Labour also... People quit the government and came back not that long later. You know, David Blunkett resigned after a scandal as Home Secretary. He was back not that long later. Peter Mandelson resigned and then came back in. It's not unprecedented for politicians to mess up, say sorry, but then get another job. If you've breached the ministerial code six days ago, six days previously, and then the Prime Minister reappoints you to the job that is in charge of security, national security, that takes this immensely seriously, where there are still a huge number of questions to be answered about whether or not this was the only occasion in which there had been these kinds of security lapses, whether or not that she had been involved in other kinds of security uh, lapses where there have been and, allegations and do you think as well. She should stand aside? And I do think, she, do you think she should stand aside? Should she resign? Yeah, I think. And um, let me finish the point first. And where there is also. Uh, reports of the Cabinet Secretary and the Cabinet Office having advised against this appointment. So Keir Starmer has already made clear that Rishi Sunak should be replacing her. It was an error of judgment to appoint her to this immensely serious job and to do so for the sake of a political deal just in order to get his way into number 10 just shows a carelessness towards okay. those national and security well, issues. He, he would, I'm that sure, is deny just, that that's what this It's just was not about. responsible. But I think clearly this is a, a moving story. I'm sure we're going to hear more about it in the next few days. I'd like to ask you about what's happening at the Immigration Processing mm. Centre, Manston in Kent. Now, around 2,600 people are being held there. The maximum capacity is about 1,000 less than that. Clearly, it's an unsatisfactory situation. We can see some pictures of the centre now. Would a Labour government spend more money on funding for immigration centres? Well, I think what you've got to do is overhaul the whole system and have much stronger action to prevent the dangerous boats crossing the channel that are putting lives at risk in the first place. And you have got to speed up the whole system because there's a reason why they've ended up with these appalling conditions with diphtheria outbreaks and so on. It's because they're decision-making on asylum has collapsed. They were taking twice as many asylum decisions a year, six years ago, as they are now. That collapse in decision-making and some of the additional legislation they brought in, which is lengthening the time, mm -hmm. has created huge backlogs. That is a problem and a, a problem of the Conservatives' making, and it's their failure to speed up the decision-making that has led to this. how would you solve that? Because so it's you need to, to speed up. harder to solve. You need to speed up. We need to get back to the levels of decision making that we had even just five or six years ago and the much higher levels that we had under a Labour government. You need to speed up those decisions. We also need a new agreement in place with France uh, around the uh, channel crossings and we need a significant increase in the activities of the National Crime Agency mm -hmm. because what's happened is you've got a proliferation of organised criminal activity mm -hmm. in the channel that has escalated really in just the last couple of years. But Cooper, That's if, got to be dealt if, with. Yvette Cooper, if you make it easier for people to come, doesn't that in just encourage the numbers upwards? 
But what I've just talked about is cracking down on the criminal gangs that are exploiting people in the first place. And th there's a tiny, really, amount of mm. activity by the National Crime Agency at the moment. Mm -hmm. We've but seen you a multi-million pound... Speeding up the process. Mm. Now, I'm not saying if that's right or wrong, but if you speed up the process, does that not then encourage more people to come to the UK? Oh, well, you speed up the process, you get proper decisions being made. So that means that refugees get the support that they need if they have fled persecution and conflict. And as a country, we We've always done our bit mm -hmm. to support those who fled persecution and we should do so. But what it also means is those who are not refugees should be swiftly returned as well. So it means you have an effective system rather than one that just drags on forever and costs huge amounts and of on, money. And on principle, mm. would you like the level of migration to increase or to fall? Around 240,000 people came to the UK last year. Would you like to see that higher or lower? So we support a points-based system. The whole point of a points-based system ought to be that actually you look at it area by area rather than having net migration targets. We don't fully know what's going on, the row that seems to be in the government at the moment. It looks as though Suella Bravman is trying to return to the failed net migration target that we had. But my question to you is, would know, you like 240,000 to go down or to go up? It's a, that's a question of principle, isn't it? it? It's, well, let me answer your question because the principle is, do you think you should target net migration? Should that figure, should you have a lower target, which is what uh, Suella Braverman seems to be calling for? She seems to want to go but back to the want? David Cameron what one. Wait want? a minute, let me finish. you need to let me finish the point first, Laura. Or whether you have the Liz Truss approach, which seemed to be to have a higher net migration target in order to have an impact on growth. We think both of those are the wrong approach. What you should be doing is looking sector by sector, and I'll give you, for example, of an area we would reform, of time. which is health and social care, biggest area for overseas recruitment. The social care visa, excellent visa that is right to support people, but we should be doing far more training here at home. That is what Labour would do. So that would end up reducing the number of the need for... Well, that would end up in that area, would end up reducing the need for overseas recruitment of doctors and nurses because we should be training far more ourselves. And that would be... Uh, and also increasing the um, fair pay agreement for social care as well. Okay. That's a responsible approach. Look at the evidence sector by sector. OK, Yvette Cooper, thank you so much for coming. Coming in. It's great to have you. I hope you come back soon. Thank you. Because it is nearly now 10 o'clock. Yes, can you believe it? 10 o'clock. If you still haven't got round to changing your clocks, get on with it. It is nearly 10 o'clock. And this morning, we fired the levelling up secretary, Michael Gove, defending the position of the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. Suella apologised for the mistake that she made and indeed resigned from government. Uh, but the Prime Minister has made it clear that uh, Suella deserves a second chance and I'm glad that Suella is in Cabinet because she's uh, a first-rate front-rank politician. Well, very brief final word with our panel. Caroline Lucas, do you think that Suella Braverman will survive in her job? I fear she will, but she certainly wouldn't, and it completely undermines what Sunak said on the doors of, of, of Downing Street when he said he was going to bring integrity and accountability to his job. He has failed at the first hurdle, so absolutely she should go. There should be an inquiry, and the idea that she's there because basically she got him into power, I think, stinks. Philip Hammond, should she stay or go? Oh, I understand why the Prime Minister wants to bring her back. I think he does need to be very careful about the signals it's sending about the ministerial code. Mm -hmm. I'm actually more interested in what it says about internal Tory party politics and the difficult decisions, because one of the difficult decisions that has to be made to get economic growth is to have a more relaxed approach to migration for work. But it sounds that you're not very happy about her being in the job. Well, I'm concerned about her policy position on this issue. OK, Ian, yes or no? Do you think she'll be in her job by this time next week? I'm paid to do this. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> OK, what a great trio you have been. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, Philip Hammond, Ian Anderson and Caroline Lucas. And that is it for our first programme with Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister. One thing is becoming clear, that this government might want you to think that it's all steady, maybe even a bit boring in politics now. But we've heard, not just because of his appointment for, of Suella Braverman at Home Secretary, there are going to be problems. It is not going to be dull. And Michael Gove could not promise either that benefits will rise in line with inflation, something he previously said he wants to see. Maybe, just maybe, warming us up for an announcement in the next couple of weeks. Remember, Rishi Sunak's popularity soared when, during the pandemic, he gave out, by borrowing, lots of money to keep the country going. But times have got tougher and money tighter. 
and perhaps he's not yet had to make the myriad of difficult decisions that face any Prime Minister, maybe especially him. What will he do about the NHS? Will he come up for, with a proper plan for social care? How will he solve the problem of a housing market that, as we've discussed this morning, doesn't seem to work for many people? And always, of course, in the background, rising inflation, making us and the country poorer. Whatever the Prime Minister chooses to do, being boring is not an option. Thank you so much for watching this morning. If you've missed any of the programme, you can watch it again on the iPlayer. Until next week. Goodbye.